Hi everyone, welcome to Books in the World. Um, I'm Madeline Holt and I'm here today with Randy Susan Myers. Hi Randy, nice to meet you. Um, we're going to have a good time today. Um, Books in the World has been recording for many years as a production of the Cape Cod Writers Center. And every week that I do this, I think I have the best book and the most interesting and the most fun. And today is no exception. Randy has written a book called Wasted, and it's about um, women and their struggles with weight, weight loss, weight gain, um, body image, self-image, self-confidence. It is just, it's a great read. If I don't say it often enough during the show, go get this book. Anyway, let me read a couple of reviews. Every one of them could have been written by you or me if you're a woman watching this show. <laughs> but anyway, Library Journal, which is so important to librarians, as I've told people often, Myers delivers a timely examination of body image, family, friendship, and what it means to be a woman in modern society. It will appeal to anyone who has ever dreaded stepping on a scale. Even those who haven't will learn from it. Culturally inclusive and societally on point, this is a must read. I, I have so much I want to ask you that I don't want to spend too much time with this, but one of your other reviewers said that this is like people who have, have women feel that they've had a PhD in weight loss and gain. And the fact that I actually saw that in print, I have heard women say that. <laughs> I could have a PhD in weight loss. I am so, anyway, pleased to have read your book. It was a lot of fun. It's been um, picked as uh, one of the best summer reads by Boston Globe, Parade Magazine, several other places, Hop Sugar, Book Bub. It's been nice. Very good. And you were featured on the Today Show? Uh, on their, their, the Today Show basement. It was <laughs> on their, on their um, online version. Oh, okay. The they basement. wrote an article about me. All right. Well, tell us a little about yourself before we dive into the book. Well, let's see. I have had um, a plethora of jobs. Uh, I published my first novel when I was 57. Before that, I ran a community center in Boston in Mission Hill, which I dove into for, for this. Yes, yes, I was yes. a bartender for many years. I ran all the community centers for the city of Boston when I worked for the city of Boston. And in my last job before I turned to full-time writing was working with criminals for 10 years. So I've had a very varied past to draw on for my writing. Well, some of it comes through in your story. Um, I, I love the characters. I guess one of them runs community centers. <laughs> that was actually, you know, it, it, it's really fun when you can draw on little bits yeah. of your past. Yeah. <laughs> um, when people ask me if, if this book is about me, I always use a quote that I stole yeah. from Carolyn Parkhorst, but I told her I stole it, who, the author of Tower of Babel. She's yep. a wonderful yep. writer. Yep. And she writes, when you make a batch of cookies, you put butter in and you stir it in. And then when you bite into the cookie, you're not biting into a big chunk of butter, but you flavor the cookies. And that's what we do, right, is we flavor all of our, all of oh. our cookies and our books are our cookies. Our books are our cookies. <laughs> well, summarize the plot just briefly and then we'll delve into some of the issues that you cover. Sure. Uh, the novel, from two points of view, is about women who for whom being, becoming thin becomes the most important thing in their life, and it overshadows everything. One of the main characters is Daphne. Daphne um, has a very good marriage, she has a great job, she has wonderful children, but all the only voice in her head is her mother constantly criticizing her about being overweight. She's got two really thin sisters, a thin mother, and she is like the monster in the family, she thinks. Then we have Alice, who grew, grew up with a black Southern Baptist um, athletic father from Georgia and a tiny white mother from Brooklyn, and she lives in Massachusetts in Mission Hill. And she meets her husband when she's breakup skinny. And if those of you who don't know what breakup skinny is, it's when you break up and you lose a bunch of weight and then it comes back on. Uh. So she meets Clancy when she's breakup skinny and then she starts to become who she is and he's unhappy. And Alice and Daphne meet at a place called Wasted, a mansion in Vermont where they are promised 
hope for becoming a new them, and in fact, are in a very evil place. And it moves on from there. Well, wasted, it's also called privation center. When you walk in, the brochure says wasted, but the sign when they walk into the mansion says, welcome to privation. Welcome to privation. And that's when they first know we're not in Kansas. Well, that's, that's a strong word, privation. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and even though I noticed it, I, was, and I started to get an, an uneasy feeling. I could be every reader, probably. You could find out what your readers think. Just talk to me. <laughs> you can interview me. You know, I know something bad's going to happen here. And it, it does. And um, it, it's, there's a lot of humiliation. Um, they're shaming these women. Um, is this is this supposed to be a parody of the TV show, the the Biggest Loser, in, in some ways? Well, I don't know if it's a parody of the Biggest Loser, but it's certainly an exaggeration, or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did a lot of research, um, and the Biggest Loser, the people who go on that show sign really intense non-disclosure. So you have to really work hard to find out what really goes on behind the scenes. But it's not pretty. Uh, not only are they treated very intensely uh, and not only is there well there's, on the screen it's nothing but humiliation mm -hmm. it's I mean you, it's hard to parody what's already a parody of our society and the amount of, almost every person who lost weight on that show gained it all back because their metabolism became wrecked mm -hmm. Go, losing weight in that manner does nothing but ruin your body um, and so yes I did that was one of the inspirations. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show something like The Biz Biggest Loser, but rather than just having it filled with the heaviest among us, but how even people who are just really normal overweight make themselves crazy and, and, and try and let weight rent too much space in the head. Let all, let all body image issues rent too much space in our heads. Me included. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely me. Um, so why did you write this book, and how long has it been gestating? <laughs> well, I, this is my fifth novel, but I've been wanting to write this novel for four novels. It's been percolating, gestating. I had the first line for a long time, and the first line that I had was, everyone hates a fat woman, and then it grew to everyone hates a fat woman, but none more than she hates herself. And I didn't have the courage to write it until now. Um, and there's a, a, a probably more than a few reasons for that. Um, but the biggest one was that even though previously I've written about domestic homicide, sisters who witness their father kill their mother and what their life is like for the next 40 years, traumatic brain injury, affairs, adoption, all of that was easy, even though it had some reverberance to me, compared to this, because this was such a huge issue to me. Body image, body shaming, and weight was something I would wake up thinking about and go to sleep thinking about. You know, it was never, the whole world was divided, the world of food was divided into good and bad, or maybe kosher and non-kosher, <laughs> you know? Uh, so. I didn't have the guts for a while because I knew if I was going to write it, it had to be honestly done. So you mentioned that some of it is based on your own experiences and these feelings that you have, but did you also do research? Um, uh, one of the things that came to me is that since you talked about having been a counselor and working in um, the um, Breck Center kind of environment, whether you, you must have had a lot of stories from women who had problems. Well, the way, you know, a lot of people have asked me about research, and I've done a ton, and I can talk about it. But one of the ways that we do research is that we're women in America, and we have friends yes. and family. Yes. I mean, have, I was thinking the other day, I was meeting with my writers group. We hadn't seen each other for a while. And the first thing we all said was, oh, you look great. Oh, you look beautiful. And I was, why, afterwards, the, why do we do this? Right, why is the right. very first thing we do comment on each other's appearance? Not in a bad way, but right. as this is our way of reassuring. It's like our handshake. Yeah. You know, um, it, oh, you look so beautiful. So, I, you know, I've been in the same women's group for, oh my goodness, if I say how many years, uh, 
over 40 years that we've been, you know, remember when women's groups were big, well, yeah. mine yeah. stayed together. Yeah. Oh, nice. And the issue yeah. of weight is just so there. Some of the research I did that was especially interesting, I did on all the crazy um, diets, how far women will go. I went to a ton of sites where people talked about, you know, how to be anorexic. I read probably 50 memoirs, and I, I do like reading memoirs mm. on, on this topic, written by men and women. One of the best memoirs was called Born Around by Frank Rooney, New York Times columnist. But I found a site that fascinated me, where women put up pictures of themselves but not their faces, uh, and they put their height and their weight and what size they were. And going through that made me see what, you can be the same, you know, five, two and 180 pounds and look a hundred different ways. Um, so yeah, I was lost in the world of women and, yeah. and also I read so much about body positivity, what that means to women, the difference okay. between young women and how their attitude has changed from, you know, our generation. So yeah, it was fascinating. Yeah, well, you you have the PhD in weight loss I do now. I have the PhD. And the the uh, and weight gain. The way, <laughs> the way uh, some of your reviewers have talked about it. One of them talks about this fist pumping reaction. She says, "Yes, yes, yes." You, know, you go through the whole book, f pumping your fist. I think that. Yeah, readers will ride a tilt a whirl of emotion, fist pumping chief among them as, as Alice and Daphne wage war on their inner demons and the heartless filmmaker who would exploit their deepest wounds for his own gain. Um, mothers and daughters, uh, one of the, I think, amusing but sad scenes in the book is about Daphne going to try to buy a, a dress to wear for her her sister's wedding. This is before she goes to the, the weight loss place. And it, it is just so spot on about dressing rooms and sales girls and buying these dresses that look like tents and worrying about your arms and is the jacket long enough and all that. And, and, then, and then she, tell about the scene, if, you're, if we're thinking about the same scene, if I, not, I will, about when the mother grabs her at the wedding. Oh, she, so she's wearing this outfit that she just, you know, she had pictured herself getting a very chic dress somehow, mm -hmm. something that would at least just be black and simple. Right. And she ends up in this mauve disaster, and she says to herself, you know, mauve is a color for people, you know, two years away from the nursing home. And she's wearing this mauve dress brocaded with a jacket that the covers and she's just so hot. hot. It's an outdoor wedding in um, the Di Cordova uh, Sculpture Museum yep, yep. and she's just and her husband, she's a dear husband, says take off your jacket Daphne and she won't, she won't, she won't because she won't show her arms. We all know what, well many of us know what that's <laughs> like. And she finally does, and she feels this sense of relief, and maybe I can be different. And then before she knows it, her mother comes over to her and says to the husband, I, I need Daphne for a minute. And Daphne's in this warm place, and she's thinking, oh, you know, I forget I have to take care of my mother. She's older. And her mother grabs her with her claw-like hand and says, put that jacket back on. Do you know what you look like without it? Oh, gosh. <laughs> and I felt that scene. Oh, gee. I felt it in my gut. Oh, my. Well, mothers and daughters, first of all, I, I have to make sure that reader, readers and listeners know that this is not chiclet. <laughs> this is, this, these families are well developed. Every single mother, every single character, mother, father, um, brothers, sisters are all very real and very, and they're all good people. They're, this, these are not, not really dysfunctional families, I guess. I, I wouldn't say that. Well, no. they're dysfunctional. Normal dysfunctional. Average, average, <laughs> average normal dysfunctional. Okay. You know, our, our kind of families. <laughs> <laughs> Most people's families. My kind of family. Yeah. Family, yeah. So, but these two women, among others, um, are, um, they're suffering because of their mother's attitudes toward them. Just to know a few words about each of the mothers and how they approached their daughters and why it was so hurtful. Well, for Daphne, um, it's her mother has an ideal thought of what her daughter should be. You know, uh, she had one of her daughters is gay, 
and so she has to find a way to make that okay. And, and it's, what's interesting is her gay daughter becomes like this perfectly coiffed, gorgeous, you know, lipstick lesbian. Mm -hmm. And then she has a, a doctor, uh, one of her daughters has bad skin, she becomes a dermatologist. And Daphne, who really got the brunt of it for being heavy, I mean, Daphne, there was a scale placed in the entryway to the kitchen. That's hysterical. In their house. Where did you come up with that idea? That well, is funny. I'm hoping that my <laughs> aunt won't be seeing this. She's in her very late 90s in Florida. But let's just say there was a family option for stepping on the scale as you went into the kitchen and somebody in my family. <laughs> and so this is where you steal uh -huh. pieces uh -huh. of your life. Uh -huh. And. Um, She's a very critical person. She's afraid to show her mother the dress that she buys for them because she knows the first thing her mother will do will look at the size. And there's a constant stream of not good enough. Alice, on the other hand, her mother is so supportive that Alice finds that annoying, <laughs> showing that you can't win. Mm -hmm. We can't win as mothers or daughters. Her mother says, you know, you're a beautiful, um, muscular, statuesque black woman. You can be any, you know, you can be anything you want. And mom is really teeny. And so Alice finally gets really angry and says to her, why do you discourage me from wanting to be thin? You know, because I'm black, I'm not allowed to be thin. So no matter what, we've got problems here. And they are both mo mothers of daughter, Al daughters, right. Alice and yeah, Daphne. Yeah. And so now we have reverberation there, which is for Daphne, who has a teenage daughter, her daughter finally comes out with her and to her and says, you never once talked about how nice I looked. Because in fact, Daphne has worked her whole life to never mention her daughter's looks because her mother did it so much to her. Oh goodness, <laughs> that was a shock for Daphne. That was deal. quite a shock for yeah, Daphne. Yeah, and um, Alice and Clancy have a little child, a, a younger daughter, but both of them, um, when they come back from this horrendous experience, and we're, we're slyly not telling the audience who lost weight, who gained weight, <laughs> what happened. I like that, no, Madeline. No spoilers here. But the, the thing that I was really moved by is the way the daughters w communicated their, their fears to their mothers. That first of all, they were, well, maybe they were different in each case, but in summary, they were worried about their mothers, um, worried that the mothers were unhappy, um, and it, it sort of reverberated. Of course, they, the mothers disappeared and went away for this weight loss thing. And it was very, very difficult for those girls. I, it's well, we, we measure our mothers, I think, with eyes that are like microscopes. We can tell every change in behavior, every change in mood. We can just, it's just like I always say, women, when their husbands come home, they can tell their husband mood by the air around the doorknob <laughs> when it opens. And I think it's the same thing with mothers and, and daughters. And for Alice, her little daughter kept saying to her, people like you better when you're skinny, right? Yeah. Um, and so Alice was twisting herself into a pretzel to try to both be able to own the fact that she might be thinner and want to be thinner, but not to say it was a value judgment against anybody who wasn't thinner. And so that's a really, I mean, these are, there are no simple and easy answers for anything, um, except for one thing, when people ask, well, do you think you should tell people when they're, if they're overweight? And I say, you know, people all have mirrors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, no, no, no. <laughs> no. We don't need to comment on what other people look like, except to say, Boy, you look healthy and wonderful, whatever it is. Uh, Daphne's daughter goes from being really angry at her mother to being very protective of her mother, Correct. interestingly, uh, because yeah. she suddenly feels, I think she suddenly became aware, because she's older, of what a tightrope women walk, and she was a woman walking that same, same knife edge of insanity. Well, we've, we've touched a little bit on the mixed race issue that Alice was half white and half black and that um, her mother sort of had this stereotype idea that she could be this 
Amazon, and of course Alice didn't like having to live up to that. But that's what I thought was so good about your book. I felt like you must have known these people. Um, nothing was nothing was easy. No, you know, you didn't have any easy answers. It was very fleshed out, if I can use the word flesh. <laughs> you know. uh, for example, husbands and sex. You you went into that whole subject, how the women felt about themselves. Um, one of them has a very dear husband, the saint, the doctor, the doctor, the doctor saint. The saint. My, my son, the doctor, the saint. You know? <laughs> but he, he, I mean, she, I guess she didn't believe him when he said, I love you anyway. I mean, and she, he didn't even say anyway. He just said, I love you. Yeah. You get your mother's voice is renting too much space in your head. And he would, the one thing that would make him very angry was when she would pull back because of her mother's voice. Yeah. Um, and, and his anger was, your mother's opinion means more to you than mine does. But I also think men aren't aware how even when they say, I love you, you're beautiful to me, blah, 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 how much we are assaulted by the world, by Instagram, by everything, how we'll position our body to lay a certain way so our stomach is exactly as, I don't think <laughs> men do that when they're in the bedroom in the same way, like, hmm, maybe if I put my leg like this. Um, and it's interesting, I, I know, really? Yeah, really. <laughs> you were worrying about me being honest? Um, <laughs> when I was interviewed for my book launch, I was interviewed by Matthew Gilbert from The Globe, who's yeah. a dear friend, he's, a, he's yeah. a doll. Good for you. And he said, one of the things I have to say, even though I'm woke, he said this, and he wouldn't mind me saying this, he said, I'm really woke. Woke. Uh, woke. Yeah. You know, about yeah, yeah. issues for women. But, I mean, how much of an exaggeration is this? Do women really care? Are they that aware of issues with body, body image and how they look? <laughs> I turned to, it was in Brooklyn Booksmith, and I turned to the, you know, over 100 people, most, many of them women, I said, well, women, and they all like, Oh, Matthew, <laughs> of course it is. So, um, even with the best, the best, having the, a saint of a husband is helpful, but it's no guarantee it of anything. It doesn't get you past that. I, I was, um, I think one of my questions was in my mind, so, so Randy, what's the bottom line about this? But I'm, I don't think you're really offering it. I mean, I think part of it is um, both women are starting to learn about their own goodness and the world around them and the people around them. I, I'm, what I'm trying to get to is something you said with the women's group that you're part of, that the first thing you say to each other is how you look. You know, how, gee, you look great today, or oh, I lay in game, lay game weight, or I got my hair dyed, or I got my hair cut, mm -hmm. or whatever. That shirt's nice. Oh, I paid nothing for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so. But to getting from from all of that and getting away from that, getting to say, you're a writer, I'm a librarian, We're f somebody's a filmmaker, somebody's a cook, you know, a makeup artist, and, and we have great relationships with our family and friends. How, how are we gonna learn to put all of I, that I, first? I actually <laughs> did have, um, I take it, because I, as I said, going into this book was really, really scary. Mm. And I did learn some things. Um, <coughs> first, I had some memories. One of my memories was when I was a little girl, my mother, my tiny little mom, hid, and I've been up and down the scale many times, she hid, we lived in this tiny little Brooklyn apartment, my tiny mom in the tiny apartment, and she hid the cookies all the way on top of the highest shelf in a lobster pot in Brooklyn, because, you know, and my sister and I learned to be mountain climbers very early on. And we could just pop those cookies right out. But then I would hide them in the bottom of the hamper to eat in secret. And then I remembered, these were all coming back to me, how my mother would say to me every time we were on the phone together, you know, she's not with us anymore, she'd say, so how's your weight? Really? As though my weight yeah. was like a little puppy that I carried with me. Then I remembered my uncle at my, my wonderful Aunt Thelma's funeral. And we both stood there and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he said, oh, such a shame. And I said, I know. And he said, she used to be so beautiful and look how fat she got. This is in, in the casket. And then he 
points his finger at me and says, you better watch out. Oh, gosh. And the last memory I have was of my wonderful and kind grandmother. At 94, uh, for her birthday, we all got together, and she was eating the cake, and she said, oh, I shouldn't. Like she was waiting to be a size two or something uh, at, yeah, after yeah. 94 years of living. So I realized something. A, this is what came to me after this all. When I want to eat a piece of cake, I am going to eat that piece of cake. And I am not going to eat it from the hamper. I also realized I am very crazy about this issue. So I better figure out a way to, that I can manage my crazy. And I have figured that out. But the most important thing I realized is this. Smart is beautiful. Kind, kindness is magnificent. And wisdom will save the world. And that's what we have to concentrate on more than anything else. Good, good thoughts, and you have some scenes about that in, in your book. And I love the dialogue with the girls um, where she's trying to say all that to the Smart is Beautiful Club, and the girls keep saying, but isn't pretty good? I know. I, 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 I thought it was funny. She's being so sincere. And goes, yeah. But, but being beautiful is the most important thing, right? <laughs> yeah, oh I mean, we, we have our work cut out for us. There's no doubt. Well, I think it's a great campaign. I think, thank you. you know, thank you for writing this book. Um, I think it should sell a few million copies, and good well, luck to you with As my that. grandma, my other grandmother used to say, your mouth to God's ears. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then it could be a movie, and is it an audio book yet? It is an audio book, yeah. it's an e-book, it's a, it's a Titcom's bookstore right down the street. I, well, it's not down the street, it's 30 minutes well, away. Well, it's sort but, of down but Route 6A, was, which we all, we know, we know what I you was, mean I by down the I was there last the night, street, and that yeah. was really fun, so yeah. yeah, it's not hard to get. Well. We, we have other topics that I wanted to ask you. You're a writing teacher. You um, work at Grub Street as well as other places. We are out of time. I just uh, wanted to also mention you have a lovely book club offer on your website. Right, and in I fact, do. we can close by, you can explain I'm, that. I wish I had a copy. I gave away that last copy I had. I always do a little extra something for book clubs when I, I have a Comfort of Food Cookbook. I had the discomfort of money uh, about um, from my last book. I put together a anthology called um, Women Under Scrutiny. All profits benefit Rosie's Place. It's from women from 17 to 76 sent in their essays, and we picked the winners, um, and they are magnificent. And it's every culture, race, creed, and color, and it is one of the my passion projects that I'm, I'm going to so proud have of. To, oh, that's great. So thank you for coming. I'm sorry to have to cut you short. Go to um, randysusanmyers.com, and you can get the book club offer, which is a great idea. So thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. It's Mel. been this was fun. lots of fun meeting you. Oh, great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the book.